All right, welcome back, or welcome if this happens to be the first of my videos that you're watching. I am currently celebrating the two-year anniversary of this channel, and I'm going to try to put out uh, a lot of extra content for that, but also because I've kind of been absent for a little over a month. And nothing, nothing is seriously wrong. Maybe I'll talk about that later. I've just had a lot of other things going, and, and life has been conspiring against me. But that's neither here nor there. Now, the first video I did to celebrate this anniversary was revisiting my first sword review, which was this Lue Sword Unakubi Zukiri. And I, I didn't do a terribly good job back then. Hopefully my follow-up was a lot better. You know, let me know. Uh, so far I'm getting good feedback on it. But it was kind of long. Now, I figured a great follow-up to that would be to re-review, well, the second sword that I reviewed on this channel two years ago, which is the Lue Sword Kogarasu Maru. And there are going to be a lot of things similar between the two swords, so I don't want to totally repeat everything from that review. I also don't want to make it quite as long. And then I, I do want to kind of shake things up a bit because of the nature of this particular blade profile. So let's get right into it. Okay, so as is kind of traditional around here, I'm going to start with the sit-down presentation where I'll talk about fit, finish, the value for the money. And then I'll get my ass out of the chair and I'll do a brief handling demo, which will also cross into, well, not only things that are specific to this blade profile, but also some other projects I'm working on and hopefully you'll get to see some content on soon. But more on that later. Let's start with value for the money. Now, referring back to the video I did on its on its brother, the Unikubi Zukiri, still available at the Luesword.com website for $238. And in that recent review, re-review, I expounded on how, yes, I don't think it's it's vastly, vastly worth that. But there are some significant cost-cutting measures that you're going to run into. Whether those are important to you or not is, is kind of up to you. In my case, there were some things I could adjust and uh, kind of fine-tune and make it more appealing to me, or if you're crafty like I am, you can swap out some of the parts that are annoying you, do some upgrades, or, or maybe you know somebody who can do it for you and at hopefully an affordable rate maybe for free, I don't know. But the idea is, you know, it could potentially be a, a good base for a, a project or custom sword. So the conclusion was, I think you're getting a great deal of value for the money, but there's some places where you're going to notice why it's so cheap. In many ways, same, same here. Now, this is a slightly more expensive sword, still available at lewisard.com. How, how much more expensive are we talking about? 11 bucks. $249. Okay. Now, are you just paying for the difference in the blade profile? Actually, no. They did throw in a few things in terms of upgrades to, to sweeten that deal, which I do think are worth more than 11 bucks. So yeah, value I, I think is even a little bit higher on this sword. But let's talk about the fit finish, the specs, and, and where those cost-cutting measures are. Now, from basically the Suba down, we're talking about the same exact sword as the other one. So again, I don't want to repeat myself in, in too much detail or length. The only real difference is the color of the Ito. And as I mentioned in, in that previous review, they say silk, but I think it's synthetic. Nice small diamonds, pretty even. They did a good job with it. But the biggest issue for me, uh, the plus, is that it's super tight and everything is stayed absolutely put very good, solid, functional wrap, including these, the way these Manuki are mounted on the outside. You think that would, they would wiggle around a lot. They don't budge at all and haven't in two years. And yes, I do handle this sword a lot because it is so comfy in the hand that, yeah, they haven't budged anywhere. Now, one of the things about handling a sword like this a lot that you may or may not see in my pictures and videos is flashback to, if you guys are Deadpool fans, you know, you re wear the red outfit so you don't show blood and hey he's smart he wore the brown pants um colored ito for me if it's not black or brown will start showing dinginess from oil on the hands which is one of the reasons why i do not own a white wrapped sword <laughs> hey i'm not even going to want to touch it 
but my blue ones and my red in the red. Yeah, it's 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 showing a little bit of, of, of hand grime. Hopefully it's it's not too unsightly. But you know, color preference is your own. Otherwise, as I mentioned, ten and a half inch suka, a little bit shorter than the average one, but but I happen to like it a lot. A little bit slimmer also than your average one. And I have small hands and when I was stuck in that brace, didn't have a lot of grip girth and then I had even less, yeah, skinny, skinny handle was nice and still feels good today. So that's, that's still a positive. Real race skin panels, small nodes, so it's kind of cheap stuff, but at least it's real. Cost cutting and maybe not so much cost cutting. The Fuchi Kashra Suba are made out of a Kind of a copper brass alloy that has been patinaed, not not painted with paint, but patinaed. So unlike some of the other cheapo swords, the, the low end swords that might have you know die cast painted fixtures that you can't really do any adjustment to, they get scuffed and the paint peels up and they look ugly. These at least you could, you could do some tuning up. So I did clean up some of the patina, and then as I mentioned, the ledges on the Fuchi and the Kashira were not they were not clean with the Ito. There were, there were some corners. So I got out my little hammer and my fine files and my fine sandpaper, and I did some adjustment, and it didn't take a lot to get this all nice and clean and even no hot spots comfy. So I did put a little bit of work into fine tuning this end of the sword. All right. Nakago is exactly the same goes down about an inch past the second pin, nothing fancy, it's not well finished, it is not signed. So that's some cost cutting there. The But everything has stayed really solid, really solid. Taken it apart a few times, moved it around, done some cutting with it, nothing on any of these has, has gotten loose. Any of the examples of these from Blue Sword stayed tight, well fit. Now, Tsuba, let's talk about that. Musashi style double lobe, everything rounded, a little bit smaller than your average Suba, which for me just makes it again a little extra comfy. No hot spots, nothing for my hand to accidentally run in on if I've, if I've got some kind of an odd angle on it in a draw or something like that. So that's all great. Let's get back to cost cutting. The Seppa have the same issue as the other sword where they significantly overlap that really skinny middle part of that relieved suba. So there's some ledges here. Now my, my hand doesn't get in there so I don't feel them, but I, I can see them and it does kind of visually bother me. And I thought about reducing them, but the fact is this middle part of this suba is actually smaller than the fuchi. So there's always going to be a ledge no matter what I do, unless I replace the suba which, you know, that, that could be a thought for you if that bothers you. It's not, not a hard job. And there are tons of choices out there on the market if you want to mount a new Suba on this. I also mentioned in the other sword review that for me, Suba that don't have a lot of metal in them like this, which is there's a lot of air in the Suba, I worry about what that's going to do to the point of balance. And this one doesn't really have a negative effect on it. And we'll get to that in just a second. But before I move up the blade, let's talk about the Habaki. In the other sword, I talked about how this sculpted Habaki, I thought I was going to really like it because it was cool and different, and I came to kind of loathe it for various reasons. Well, this gets me back to the basic plain brass Habaki. Nothing fancy, but I'm, I'm perfectly fine with this, and the fit is its fine. There's nothing wrong with the fit whatsoever. Now... Just like the other sword, the blade is where things get awesome. 28 inch blade, so shave longer than some traditional versions and what I'm used to, but I've adapted to it. Weight. One of the things I mentioned in the previous video is I thought that Unakubi Zukiri with the relief cut on the spine was going to be a whole lot lighter and balanced more towards the handle than a traditional Shinogi Zukiri. And I'm going to do a video on this to do some comparisons because the difference wasn't very much at all, if at all. And the same thing is true here. I would think having this profile where there's even more steel removed, like right here specifically, would make a, a, a very much lighter sword that's balanced closer to the hand. And the answer is yes, but only a little bit. The Unakubi Zukiri weighs two pounds, three ounces, which makes it one of my lighter swords of this style. This is an ounce and a half lighter. So 
two pounds, one and a half ounces. Yeah, so it is lighter. It is one of the lightest swords I own. But point of balance, three and five eighths inches on the on the other sword, which is pretty much right in the sweet spot of most of my Japanese style swords like this. So not a not a big variation, and it might be because there is not much suba weight here. This one only moves the point of balance back an eighth of an inch. It's three, you know, it's three and a half inches even. But again, that's that's a nice balance point for me between handling and, and blade presence. Well, let's talk about that blade. For $249, or in the other case, $238, you're getting the same blade materials quality. So finish, shape, everything's really good. No real glaring problems with any kind of uneven bohe. It does have that same kind of double bohe where you got the big bohe that goes up the part of the spine that's, you know, got the traditional mune. And then you've got a secondary finer bohe that goes, well, almost all the way up to the tip, not quite. And it rides right on the crest of what becomes then a diamond cross section up here. So in this case, the last third of the blade is double-edged and it is sharp on the back. Now, structure of the blade. This was surprising. Advertised as folded steel and Louis Sword uses a proprietary 1060-1095 blend. Same as the other sword. It's not as I've seen on certain of my other examples of, of Chinese made folded steel where they go for a really bold kind of wood grain looking folded pattern so not not a lot of many many folds going on here it's almost like they with this one they took it like one more level of folding to make the grain just a little bit finer so it doesn't show up on a lot of my cameras you can see some really clear pictures on the Loe Sword website of the grain pattern so it's visible it's prominent but it's it's not like glaringly extreme to the point where I worry about the steel being well weaker or have flaws and inclusions and stuff in it. So, and I haven't, I haven't seen anything like that with this sword. Now, just like the other sword, I failed to read the fine print to discover that for my 238 and $249, not only did I get a folded steel blade that's pretty nicely put together and well, yeah, it's probably machine polished. So consider that as a cost cutting measure. It's Sanmai. So this one is also Sanmai, and yes, I've, I've taken a look and compared it to other swords that are either Sanmai or not Sanmai, and yeah, you can see the transitions in, in the blade and in the spine. So it probably does have a core of just 1095 mono steel and then the, you know, the blended side panels. It's, it's very well done. It is clay tempered like the other one. Nice hard edge, and like the other one, this is, this is an issue that I'll probably address in other videos. A lot of the modern reproductions are designed for the backyard cutter or maybe the competition cutter who's focused on slicey through soft targets versus, I mean, they call things battle ready, but compared to my historic examples and other swords that I will talk about in other videos, not a lot of Niku, not a lot of steel meat behind that edge. So just like the other blades like this, I would not feel comfortable hitting this into anything solid. Certainly no metal on metal contact. I, I have chopped into some soft wood with it and I've used it on bottles and cardboard and stuff like that and it's held up just fine. But I'm, you know, I'm thinking you've got, because it's a very hard edge, it's about 58 Rockwell like the other one. Um, it could be, it could be brittle. And in the experiments I've done, the questionable experiments of blade on blade contact, it is really easy to chip something like this. That's, that's a risk as compared to other kinds of blade edge profiles. So that's a thing to consider. But bottom line, 249 bucks. I talked about some other upgrades. Let's talk about the actual upgrades. A lot of them are in the Saya. Now, I complained a lot about the Saya on the other sword because it's rough inside, doesn't fit very well, and doesn't. it's just wood that's badly painted over the paints coming off. The only upgrade it's got on it is it, it has some, well, some, I think it's either rattan or bamboo spiral wrapping around it to give it some kind of texture and reinforcement. Other than that, it's not a great grip. For, but for that extra 11 bucks, I've got horn. I've got horn fixtures that are pretty, I mean, they're not the cleanest, but they're actually pretty well done, and it's horn. 
on both ends and the Kurigata. Now, I did, they kind of cut back by not giving me a terribly fancy Segeo. Okay, I don't terribly care about that. It's, it's super, super easy to replace one if it bugs me. But they also, as you can see, gave me, well, not only is it a, a lacquer finish, which I'm, I'm not crazy about the piano lacquer, and you can already see some things in it. It's, it's a pretty fragile finish on any scabbard to have this particular finish. You really have to baby it. But Ray Skin, which has been kind of lacquered in flush, and um, yeah, you may decide you like something like this or hate something like this, but I, I think it's a nice touch. That extra 11 bucks, more than compensated for just in the nicer Saya. And, okay, preview before we get into the handling video. Uh, one of the things, I'll, I'll have this closer to the mic this time. One of the things I pointed out about the other one is, is going in and out, it rattled like a washboard because it was so rough inside. And that also had something to do with the shape of the Unakubi Zukiri. You can hear that sharp back edge scraping on the wood. So that's potentially problematic, right? Hear that? But it's not rattling. So better. However, there are some issues with the blade profile that give you, well, not only some different options for application, but also some challenges. Let's talk about that. Okay, in performance, I'm going to go ahead and start with the potential negatives of this particular blade design. And I've, I've talked about these in other videos that were kind of specific to the Kogarasu Maru. First of which is going to be the fact that you don't have a lot of metal on the top end of the blade. Is it going to have that mass presence resilience for really good cutting. No, it's it's not quite as, it's a nice slicey thin blade for cutting soft targets, but yeah, it doesn't have quite the meat up here, even, even for a thin slicey blade to be quite the performance cutter that you'd think it might be. So it's, it cuts a little bit different, reminds me a lot more of certain kinds of Chinese gen or certain kinds of European swords. And I, I am gonna make some comparisons, not only today, but in a future videos. So there's that issue. The other issue that came up with the uh, Unagubi Sukiri in terms of just the relief cut on the back is, is a bigger issue here if you're doing any half sorting hand on blade stuff. Because obviously I don't, want, I don't wanna put my hand here. Now, unlike in certain kinds of European styles where you grip around a straight sword to use it that way, you can't really do that with a blade that's got this kind of profile and, and not be bleeding all over the place. So the rule for swords like this in their traditional use is your hand on blade is something that puts pressure from the spine. Now, if I'm down here on the part that's still got the full spine, I'm fine. I'll just go to remember not to go up here or it's going to be bad for me. So that's an issue. I've also done a video on specifically concerns. And I talked about concerns with some of the challenges I had just resheathing the Unakubi Zukiri because the spine is different. Well, now I've got a sharp edge to deal with. So I've got to resheath this thing entirely differently. I have to, I have to do it like I would resheathe a, any other kind of double-edged sword. And I did a video on some of my tips and tricks, but it's still, it's risky, it's weird, it's different. It's something you have to get used to. So doing traditional forms for EI and Bato Jutsu and things like that, you're going, you're going to have to make some changes to what you're doing with a sword like this. That also includes the feel. Now let's talk about the feel. Now, not a whole lot different than the Unakubi Zukiri or, you know, some of my other lighter swords and swords that are balanced like this in terms of handling, add that extra comfy grip and, and, and the skinny girth of it. Just, just makes the sword really comfortable in my hand. And the biggest difference for me is going to be not just so much what I can do with it in terms of moving it around quickly and surely and really feeling like it's a nice extension of me. Uh, maybe I don't have quite the same feel of the tip as I would with other profiles because it is a little bit lighter down that end. But it feels actually really good in one hand. So yes, there are techniques using a Japanese style sword in, in one hand, and I may do some more videos on that in the future. But I, as I've mentioned, I've also been doing a lot of cross training, looking at the similarities and differences 
in Japanese and Chinese style traditional swordsmanship and European style. You can use this sword and even, even its other lighter brothers. If it's comfortable for you to use and balanced for you to use in one hand, you can apply techniques that you would apply with saber, right? They can, they can certainly be used that way. That's, that's, that's not a problem. You know, you can, you can do some of those things that you would do with a, a saber, a cutlass, uh, even something like, uh, like a back sword or side sword or something like that. And again, I'm going to do some comparisons so you've got that. Or a messer, a hanger, a falchion, a dusak. Been doing a lot of crossovers. And the specific benefit of this blade is if any of those kinds of sword techniques that you are familiar with utilize back edge cuts, you've got a functional back edge on this thing. Doesn't have a lot of mass in it, but then neither do necessarily a lot of a lot of back swords or, or side swords or things like that. So you, you've got that back edge to use. Now, if I'm using a Japanese style sword that just has the traditional spine, I, I can still do that because it still gives me some hooking action and you could rip into something, a target with the, the back of the tip and do a little bit of damage. But yeah, this, this does give you a different set of profile, so I've been kind of playing with what I can do with some of the techniques that I've been learning from other styles of swordsmanship. So that is something that, yeah, this is this is very adaptable to use like that. Obviously, also, it's going to be a little bit different in thrust. I mean, the curvature is no different than, than an Uchi Gatana, but obviously the tip is a little bit different in terms of how it'll like slide into a target or something like that, or tip slash. It's a little bit different, not a whole lot different. But if you're thinking about something that might be a crossover to someone who's familiar with, with certain kinds of European style swords where you've really gotten fond of your false edge. Well, here's a sword where you got one. This could be a bridge for you. Could also be a bridge to something like, you know, Gen, where you use that back edge or something if you're into Chinese style swordsmanship. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of interesting possibility that you could put a sword like this to, even though, yes, it's, it's really not common, and in some ways maybe not terribly well suited to a lot of traditional Japanese-style sword schools and their techniques and, and tactics. So, some things you'll have to consider if you're thinking about getting one of those. Now, obviously, there's also just the cool factor, just add something weird and different and exotic to your collection, which is probably, again, why they're so popular today in the reproduction market. So there's that. But it does take a bit of getting used to. It is a bit different and in certain ways a little bit extra dangerous to the user, maybe not as effective in some of the things that you might be used to if you're familiar with the more traditional and again, in the future, I'll do more comparisons. But, all right, not wanting to make this too long. To be continued. As usual, let's get our conversation going in the comments. If you've got any questions or any similar experiences with swords like this or from this manufacturer, we can talk about that. Thanks for watching. Thanks for following you. I'm getting, getting close to the magic 1,000. Thank you, guys sharing, and I hope to see you back for, well, whatever Mike gets himself into next. I promise there'll be more to come soon.